Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the True Psychiatry Podcast. You guys have been following our episodes for nearly two years now, um, recently on YouTube. You guys have seen all the questionings that we raise here, our efforts, uh, mine and my guests, to uh, point out the excesses of our field and what is that our field can actually do and what we cannot do, but maybe have been claiming we do, all the philosophical questionings. Today, I have the authors of what I consider the best psychopharm book I have read in my whole career. It's the Psychopharmacology Revisited, Dr. Robert Heim Bellmaker and uh, Pesach Lichtenberg. Uh, Robert uh, is a professor at Mater, Emer, Emeritus, I'm a foreigner, okay, so English, is, it's tough for me at times, at um, Ben-Gurion uh, University in Israel, and uh, Dr. Pesach. Um, currently works at the um, uh, Jerusalem uh, Mental Health Center, but is also the founder of uh, Soteria Israel and, and, um, and apparently a network of similar services in Israel right now. Um, this book, I have, I have only the Kindle version, so let me show you. This is the cover of the book, okay? Psychopharmacology Reconsidered. It's so amazingly different of any other uh, psychopharm book you're going to find, um, especially if we're talking about uh, APA endorsed books. You guys, you guys have seen me talk about uh, Schatzbergs before, where you, as you read, you have a feeling that every drug is good for everything and everything works wonderfully. And, and that kind of a thought process probably led us to the level of polypharmacy we have in the field right now. And uh, I wonder if the poor results. While this book is so amazingly grounded in actual evidence, and, and you can tell there was an effort to filter um, what is factual and what is actually uh, advertisement uh, from whoever is financing the studies. Guys, I have no words to thank you for being here this morning. Well, for me it's a morning, but um, I, I really appreciate uh, you accepting my invitation. Thank you very much for having us here. Uh, I would like to ask first, what motivated you both to write this book? A, I can speak for myself first that the, the increasing disjunction between what I was hearing at meetings and what was being demanded from me in creating questions for residents for their examinations from what I saw in my clinical practice led to a feeling that I was participating in a hypocrisy. And uh, I was getting extremely frustrated when I reconnected with an old student of mine, Pesach Lichtenberg, and who had already made a name for himself creating the Soteria Holmes, uh, which are non-drug-based treatments for mostly schizophrenia patients uh, in the community. And we began discussing the matters uh, and planning this book. I think the book doesn't represent uh, a complete synthesis of our ideas. Uh, we still have different points of view, but we've come a long way in the discussion and I've come to realize uh, that much of what I did over my 40 years in psychopharmacology was excessively optimistic, some of it because of the way science is. We, we uh, jump in leaps, uh, not in small increments, and we often jump ahead of ourselves in many areas of science. Also, because of patient demands, patients in this last half, half century have wanted simple answers. That's been our culture. And also because of the pharmaceutical industry. And I think those factors have moved together to put psychiatry, literature, and academia far from what's really happening in the field. Very impressive. And, and you see a lot of people that I interview here went through 
some sort of epiphany or discomfort, which is what motivated me for the podcast, is is uh, f- f- on my end was fairly selfish. I said my profession is becoming unbearable. You know, it's becoming unbearable to receive a patient, inherit a patient taking six, seven medications, uh, some of them addictive. You know, like what is that we're trying to do, right? So we we need to do. So I I I absolutely relate to that. How about you, Pesach? How did you end up founding the Soteria Israel? and be involved in this book? Well, uh, so two separate things. Uh, so Terry Israel was a result of, uh, of a growing disenchantment with uh, psychiatry. I, I, almost all my career I've worked in locked wards, inpatient psychiatry, and the sense just increased along with time that the place inherently is, is not, it's not a good system. I mean, you can improve the personnel, you can bring all kinds of changes, but structurally the, the hospital ward is, is not a good place to be. I mean, 30, 40, 50 people in, in, in extreme crisis, usually psychotic, uh, and you put them together in one space. I don't know who could have ever thought that might be a good idea. And, uh, and then there was another way I began thinking about alternatives. It was actually my, my, my mentor, Professor Bellmaker, who uh, first said the word soteria to me. That was the first time I actually heard that term. And, and I saw that, uh, yeah, the disenchantment uh, predated me by a long time. And there was another way of doing it. And uh, uh, I, I wrote my, the first protocol of how to do it in 2005. And it, came to fruition in 2016. It, it took a long time. Uh, I thought that my hospital, uh, I thought that the hospital where I worked would be a partner in this, that they would be joyful about this new opportunity for doing things in a different, better, more humane way. Uh, instead, they fired me, uh, which is for the best. <laughs> in retrospect, I'm, I'm pleased that I was able to uh, be completely independent uh, as I learned how to do soteria. I mean, there's no how-to manual for this sort of thing. Uh, but it was a place where the main, the, the, the center of the experience was, was to be with the person who is going through all kinds of extreme states and uh, to try to help him there. And, and we don't eschew medication, but it's, it's not this first line, it's not the central, of the, it's central part of the treatment program. And, uh, and we see the suffering person as, a, as someone who is trying to cope with things and we try to be there with him. And uh, it's, uh, the symptom is significant only insofar as it relates to the person trying to cope with life. Uh, and that's very different from the symptom rating scales where, where he's hearing voices, we must give or change or add uh, medication. Um, er, early on, uh, Chaim came and uh, he visited us. He was always he became uh, a part, a, a member in, the, in, in our nonprofit that we established. And uh, this guess goes to the second question about writing the book. It's not a book I would ever, on my own, have thought of writing. Uh, but when when Chaim offered me to to work with him in doing this. Uh, I was surprised, complimented, and knew that that when 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 my first teacher in psychiatry makes an offer like this, there was no way I, I could refuse it because you know Chaim is known as a, as perhaps as one of the leading figures in in, uh, in in psychobiology in the country. I mean, or anyone who who's anybody in this field path came through his lab. And, uh, but, but, but even before being a psychopharmacologist, he is in my eyes a scientist who's always open to seeing what's actually happening and where the evidence takes him. A, a truly inquiring mind. And, uh, and when he wanted to write about this, uh, I, I was very happy to be a part of it. And I knew he'd have disagreements, but, but, but the basic idea that, that, that uh, there's an overemphasis and overoptimism in the field of psychopharmacology, and we have to do a reassessment in order to know how 
when medication can help, when it won't help, and and when and, and to have a much more sober assessment of that, Chaim is kind enough to say that he that one of the principles he, he, he learned from me, though I never would have thought to say it this way, is that if medication isn't helping, then don't give medication. <laughs> I mean, it, it sounds ridiculously simple. He, he says uh, he learned it from me, but I, I think I learned it from him. And and uh, and it's just uh, seeing what's what's happening, understanding, as, as you've already said, the the, the problems in, in the field, and, and we can't let ourselves be uh, blind to to, to 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 these problems. Yes. Yeah, it's funny. I was. Um... So I've been in previous episodes. I questioned. Uh, uh, we, we so we have like I think three big randomized control trials, trying to answer the question: Once you have remission in schizophrenia, should you continue or taper the medication? You have a pharma-sponsored study saying continue is good for you. You have an independent study say don't do it. Um, so now we have the Hamlet and I think another two. And one question I always had was: Okay, how about when it doesn't work? What do we do when the drugs are not, not actually doing the job? Why do we keep giving, you know, so, and it's a philosophical question. It's not like, a, because we don't have any evidence to answer the question. So as I'm reading your book and I reach those questions about schizophrenia, I was like, okay, I need to talk to these guys immediately. And um, so, so if you guys can explain to the listeners why is your psychopharm book so different of anyone else they will ever read in their lives i think one of the reasons is that we come right out and say that dsm diagnoses or any other kind of system that we have today do not predict drug response. And I think any thinking psychiatrist who's lived through the last 20 years knows this, but is ashamed to say so. And so in the 50s, we psychiatrists wanted to be a scientific discipline. And we with that desire and some data, came up with the system that psychosis, schizophrenia is a dopamine abnormality and dopamine blockers help. And depression is a serotonin or noradrenaline abnormality and so serotonin or noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors help. And this became a belief system. I think when the second generation antipsychotics were developed and promoted gradually as useful in mania and in bipolar disorder, which they are, and then in unipolar depression, which they are in many cases, we should have thrown out the whole system. They are not specific to psychosis, and dopamine is not specific to psychosis or to any specific psychosis, let alone schizophrenia. We then began the what's become an epidemic of treating attention deficit disorder in children and adults with substances that release dopamine, substances that ought to cause psychosis if the dopamine hypothesis were correct, and sometimes really do. Uh, But no one who reads the literature on treatment of psychosis with dopamine blockers apparently reads the literature on treatment of attention deficit disorder with dopamine stimulators. The two sets of literatures are mutually 100% separate. And so this, this leaves the students and the young residents and the practitioners feeling that there's something dishonest going on. And uh, our book was an attempt to restore honesty. We, we believe, I certainly believe, that antipsychotic drugs 
often work in psychosis, in mania, sometimes in anxiety. Sometimes they augment other treatments, but they are far from specific. I think when we use stimulants, dopamine releasers for attention deficit disorder, we need to be terribly worried about what releasing dopamine does, especially in a developing brain. And we need to remember that the blocking drugs are used in severe psychotic illnesses. So we need to find some very empirical model. And I agree with Pesach that we expected resistance. The book would not have come out if we didn't have a few key supporters. One was Alan Francis, the editor of DSM-3, who has criticized DSM-5 for years. He told me I had to write this book, and uh, he wrote a very nice review of the book. Another supporter was Tom Van, who had been a major figure in the CINP and the International College of Neuropsychopharmacology for many years. He was 90 years old. He read every chapter of the book before he died. The book is dedicated to him. He came to these same conclusions after a 60-year career that included participating in the first studies of neuroleptics. And he said in those days, we didn't believe a DSM system. The first people who used neuroleptics believed that they were very nonspecific calming compounds. And so the structure developed in a complex way in the history of science that is now is now caused the exact kind of crisis, Rod, that you mentioned, and that was a crisis for me as well, a crisis in honesty. But there is resistance. So Pesach has come across much resistance with Sauteria houses in terms of funding, and you know about the funding situation for psychiatry in the States. I did a stint 2005 to 2018 as president of the Israel Psychiatric Association, and I tried to appoint a committee, a, a routine matter, to consider whether we were using too high a doses and too many compounds in patients. A very balanced committee, by the way, and the board went up in arms and had made the unprecedented move of canceling a presidential decision. They were not willing to have such a committee. As president of the International College of Neuropsychopharmacology 2008 and 2010, I tried to pass a rule that every symposium would present more than one drug. And as president, I could not get that passed on the organizing committee. The typical symposium, even the non-commercial symposium, had basic science, clinical pharmacokinetics, and clinical results all around a single drug that each year made a new drug sound like it was better than everything before. Each new antidepressant was better. Each new antipsychotic was better. If so, why aren't our patients improving so much more than in 1950? And I could not live anymore as a psychiatrist without saying the truth of this book which is that the antipsychotics were discovered in the 1950s, the antidepressants were discovered in the 1960s, and basically we still have that same principle. Just like we knew then, many patients do not respond. They should at least not have the side effects. Some patients respond even to placebo or to low doses. 
they don't need to get up to recommended doses. They can stay at very low dose, and some of them may be able to stop. And some patients need their medication, and they need it for a long time. But only the individual doctor over time can learn this because we don't have a diagnostic system based on true illnesses. The DSM has misled us into thinking that. We do not have illnesses for each of which there is a known treatment that must be given. Do you have anything to say, Pesach, about why the book ended up being so different, just like uh, 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 Haim said? Well, the, the book ended up being different uh, because, first of all, Haim, who initiated it, uh, thinks in a very open way and uh, was able to make a real assessment. My contribution here was where I came from, and, and, and I also... Since I don't go as far back in the field as Chaim does, though I must say by now it's been quite a while. I was a student in his laboratory a little over 40 years ago as a, med as a medical student, uh, not knowing just how significant that particular rotation would be. And uh, uh, so I was perhaps to begin with a little bit less invested in this, I, I, I believe that that psychopharmacology was a way to go. There was a time when I said psychiatric illness is brain illness. Uh, there was a time when I said biological psychiatry is the only psychiatry. And with time, I, I, I understood that uh, that these slogans, which I was saying and believing in and represented the way so many of us thought at the time, we're not doing good things uh, to our patients. And I'm happy that in this book, uh, we were able to to take that line of reasoning and, and, and play it out, see what it means. And uh, and, and, and happy that Chaim led the way with this because uh, we're talking about a, a very important uh, figure in, in this area. It, it, it's uh, it's uh, like, like, like the chief rabbi becoming an apostate. <laughs> That's a very nice. It's that's a very no, no, but 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 that's wrong to say because God forbid. What we, what we mean is 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 to bring the news of a much more nuanced approach to medication, and certainly not to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Absolutely, and and you know, um, yesterday I was on on LinkedIn uh, 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 navigating, and there was this post where professionals were. There was this small article. Um, where they were um, calling up people to reach their uh, representatives, like the political people in their lives, to increase the production of stimulants in America. And we have already, we are using per capita, the American use per capita is 10 times the one of European countries, per capita. It's not like absolute numbers, right? And, and the professionals are saying there's a crisis. It looks like we all have lost our minds. It really looks like there's no crisis. This is a fabricated thing. You know, we, we have to stop throwing this diagnosis to the wind, the syndromic diagnosis, right? And, and stop poisoning people because, you know, eventually we will face an impact on, on, on public health. We're going to have, and someone already actually spoke about it on, the mortality associated with stimulants and opioids, uh, because we we just keep a tab of the opioid. Uh, nobody really publishes the association between them and the um, the extra load that puts on your cardiovascular system. Now, I, I have thinking of the experience that you guys have. I have a question for you, Heim. It's my understanding that you took Haldol back in the day, and you and you wrote about it. I did. I've actually taken most of these substances at one point or another in uh, a workup to a clinical trial or in a phase one experiment. In 1977, we were doing a study. We wanted to do a study to see whether haldol, uh, halopyridol, would block the effect of methylphenidate 
to induce a manic-like syndrome in bipolar patients. And we didn't know what dose to use of haloperidol. We wanted to present this to the the IRB, you call it in the United States, the Investigational Review Board, or we call it in Europe and Israel, the Helsinki Committee, the committee that approves investigations. And uh, the only way I could think to do it was to try it ourselves. So a, I and a colleague each gave each other five milligrams of haloperidol, and we had a terrible experience, probably mostly akathisia, but a real slowing of thinking, almost a suicidal effect. Uh, we felt suicidal. Both of us had similar effects. We could, Luckily, we kept a good watch on each other uh, until it went away in a day or two. And uh, I've taken also second-generation antipsychotics. We did some of the first uh, phase one studies for olanzapine and have not had that. I've taken them orally rather than IV. So it might have been a slightly unusual situation. It was a terrible feeling, though. And since then, I've always been much more aware of why some, actually many, psychotic patients who take anti-dopamine compounds hate these compounds so much. Now, that they're not the only drug that patients hate. My daughter-in-law has breast cancer, and she hates her chemotherapy, hates it with all her heart, and she hates some of her doctors that give it to her. I don't believe they're doing it out of bad will, and I don't believe they're doing it because of pharmaceutical company funding. So I don't expect that everything I give will be loved. And sometimes people need neuroleptics, and sometimes they even need it involuntarily. But we need to be aware of what a terrible subjective feeling this can be, especially long-term if it takes away a person's sense of his being, and and uh, sometimes it's akathisia and can be relieved with anti-akathisia treatment. Sometimes it just has to do with dopamine blockade of anhedonia and meaning symptoms, and we can lower the dose. I say I'm a I'm an elevator doctor. I tell people. Sometimes I raise doses and sometimes I lower them. I don't just go up. There aren't elevators like that. And not everyone who comes to me wanting a perfect medicine for their problem do I have a medicine for. So not everybody who comes to me gets a simple, happy answer. But I don't think we have the answer to everything. And that was one reason why I wanted to write this book as a comprehensive textbook covering all of the psychiatric sim syndromes. There are over 20 chapters. It's not a book only about psychosis. It's not a book only about depression. There are, it is also based in pharmacology. I think the dopamine and noradrenaline and serotonin are important. But I think it's a bad joke to think that every new antidepressant that affects some new minor receptor has some advantage that we understand based on those minor receptors. Those cartoon textbooks are as untrue as um, astrological charts. And they are, they hurt me. They hurt me because they impugn my scientific credibility. And that's why sometimes my book might sound angry.
I try to be what I think is a useful text, but I, 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 I'm trying to not throw out the baby with the bathwater, but there are people who have really over-decorated this baby bathtub. Yeah, yeah. The, um, uh, here in the podcast, uh, we refer to the, the cartoon book you mentioned as, as a catalog, as an advertisement catalog, especially considering the amount of money that the author got um, from Pharma by now, $11 million, I think. Um, I entered my last, my last chapter, my last episode was, was with Lisa Cosgrove um, that researches, you know, how many docs working for the task, the task forces in the SM actually work for farm as well in the potential, you know, impact of, of that. Now, there's a statement in your book that, and then after that, I'd like to talk about specific syndromic diagnosis. But a statement uh, you guys made, a psychotic disorder diagnosis is not a proven lifetime indication for antipsychotic treatment and prophylaxis. Um, what kind of because that's, of course, how traditional paradigm is based on these days, or modern psychiatry. I don't even know how to call it. Um, okay, you have, you have schizophrenia, right? It's 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 a thing to have now, schizophrenia, and um, and you have to take this medication for the rest of your life. Um, we need obviously an alternative paradigm for psychiatry, right? We we have drugs one resource they cause what i have been referring to as uh desirable impairments at times right they, they cause a desirable impairment just like a pain medication pain when you're you're in pain your body is operating exactly as it was supposed to operate and i want to end that so i may drink alcohol i may take uh, tylenol and what i'm doing is i'm inducing a desirable impairment um we need a new paradigm do you guys have any, any idea how this paradigm would, would work? Because we're not, we cannot continue just trying to suppress what we call symptoms. We're, we, we can't just suppress symptoms. Psychiatry has to be more than, any, that, than that. Where do you see psychiatry moving in that regard? You know, I, 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 uh, I share your distress at the present system but I feel that I have had enough personal psychotherapy that I can live without having a system until the system uh, shows up. And I deal with my colleagues in cancer chemotherapy who don't have a paradigm. Every kind of cancer has a different treatment some of the treatments are curative. There are a few cancers like that. Some are symptom suppressors, like treatment of chronic gastrointestinal cancer. Every time it comes back, you hit it with something different. But it's a chronic disease, and you live with it a whole life, hopefully. And some of them you can cut out if you have squamous cell in situ. And there is no one paradigm for cancer. Once they thought it was one disease, but it's many, many, many diseases and many different approaches, and some involve prevention as well. And some, at an advanced enough age, involve waiting and ignoring the fact that you have prostate cancer. So we have psychoses like that that haven't been helped by anything, just ignore it and live with it, you know. And there are others that you really can cut out. Sometimes I think five milligrams of olanzapine for a month cuts out a delusion and it never comes back. I don't know why. I, I, I don't completely, not completely convinced that it's because I induced a disability. There may occasionally be real dopamine psychoses because I know you can induce a psychosis with enough amphetamine and stop it very nicely with a dopamine blocker. So why wouldn't that happen endogenously sometimes? 
but it's not a model for all of psychoses. Some are like you say, you just, they're like alcohol. You just calm the patient down and he doesn't talk about his inner psychoses too much. And uh, I, I think perhaps Pesach would disagree with me strongly on that. I have never succeeded personally in treating, in curing psychotherapeutically a psychotic patient. But, but maybe others have. I have never succeeded in doing it with psychotherapy alone. I've seen patients who get well spontaneously, but I've never thought it was my my interpretations that did it. And uh, so I don't have another paradigm for you, Rod. I think uh, I don't have another paradigm for for the world right now as we are losing religious belief but not finding anything else in its place and population levels are dropping and the climate is 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 looking terribly threatening and uh, and we don't know where we're going in many fields so I think my paradigm is humility as a physician and reducing level of expectations from psychiatry and medicine in general I think the answers will not come from medicine and uh, the fact is I have six wonderful children and none of them has gone into medicine they've all gone into nature preservation and ecology and uh, so uh, uh, so I must have been been a project, you know giving some message there I I, 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 I I I've had a very enjoyable career I feel I've helped a lot of people I've helped a lot of people by not giving them what they want always so like you say, the patients who come to me with six prescriptions, I give them a plan how we're going to get off at least half of them over the next year slowly. Sometimes I ask them to write out the plan. And, uh, um, and uh, but that's, I mean, you don't get to be a guru for doing that. You don't, you know... Uh, uh, so you don't get a lot of, you know, the same thing as if you've given someone a, some fantastic placebo. A, uh, uh, a, I do use placebos. Pesach taught me about it, and I, I studied omega-3 in some controlled studies and folic acid, and, and they're compounds that, that have some therapeutic benefit, but also could be used as a placebo, and you can see if the patient responds to them before you go on to what you call the suppressing medications, if those are necessary. Or the, a, but but I always like to believe in health and to the the natural processes of healing that people have within them. So. I give them folic acid, I give them omega-3, see if that works for a few weeks. And, uh, and I don't make any big promises. One of my, my things that I've always taught is that it's much better to have a mild disease and a bad doctor than a severe disease and a wonderful doctor. And uh, so uh, a lot is not in our hands. But I don't think we should make it worse by cartoon stories. I love that. Pesach, do you want to talk about the psychotherapy approach with the psychosis or anything you would like well, to add? I don't want to mislead. I, I don't do classical psychotherapy uh, for psychosis. Uh, I, I have seen that people in Soteria occasionally will uh, be able to come through a period of time there with the help of the therapeutic community where uh, th they're able to reassess the role which the, the, these peculiar thoughts which were so disrupting their life 
what the role of these thoughts should be uh, and, and, and to, to change the way they live their life. It's different from the model of let's just uh, you know, take out the psychotic thought and then he'll be better, but it's to help someone be in a place where he can reassess his life in a secure situation in order to be able uh, to, to continue in a constructive way to return to his family in this particular case that I'm thinking of and to be able to do that. Uh, and it's, uh, I, I agree with Chaim, I, I really disagree with him in the bottom line, that it, it, there's not a single paradigm, uh, there's not a single role, we're not talking ideology over here, we're talking about trying to help people. And, and the responsible psychiatrist, I suppose like the oncologist, needs to know all of the different possibilities. For one person, the, the placebo might help. Someone else might come through it. A third one might need a supportive environment. A fourth one, you will think of the medication as like alcohol, the example we've used, as something which calms them down. It's not antipsychotic, but it helps the psychosis very much not by correcting some kind of dopamine excess, but by uh, calming the person down. And for someone else, it might indeed have some kind of more specific dopamine action. We need to be aware of the different possibilities and not to be at all doctrinaire about a specifically psychopharmacology approach or otherwise it's not treatment. We must not think that way. My staff, I always... Uh, uh, correct them when they when they say what treatment does he get so I say well we've spoken to him we've put him in the group no no I mean medication well then say medication medication and treatment are not synonyms uh, one principle though which I think I'm also touched on which which is almost universally applicable is the idea of shared decision making I, I share these thought processes as far as possible with the patient I say you know, these are the possibilities, these are the chances. We can try this, it sometimes works. And, and I'm sorry I'm not offering you a panacea here. I, I promise if I had one, I wouldn't keep it from you. Uh, but that's not the situation. Let's think about it. You develop a real rapport and connection which you're going to need in the inevitable vicissitudes of, 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 of the patient's progress or deterioration. You need to have that kind of trust and partnership. Uh, and, uh, and, and ethically, I don't want to, I, I want to be as honest as I can with the people who come to seek my advice and get my help about what uh, needs to be done. Um, so, yeah, that, 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 that's the way I think it needs to be. Whatever kind of psychiatrist you're going to be, you need to be that kind of psychiatrist who's aware of the different possibilities and tries to apply the right one in each uh, situation. Yeah, I I struggle always with... Um, uh, I used to have a mentorship institute for uh, psych and PDs, and what seems is that psychiatry got so simplified that this kind of thought process is just... You and I know we should be it should be the artistic psychiatry should this this artistic endeavor should should prevail over a very simplistic or reductionistic um let's call paradigms but it's hard to convey that it's hard to look at someone in the eye and say listen this is an artistic expression you have a lot of science behind it right but you don't know what you're looking at when you're handling treatments would you guys say the, the statement about psychosis, right? Having a diagnosis of psychosis is not a, 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 a statement that the person should be on antipsychotics for all their life. Would you say that applies to mania as well? Meaning experiencing mania once in life does not mean the person has to be on a, a, a mood stabilizer for the rest of their lives. So... My next questions will be related to specific uh, groups of, of DSM syndromes. Like, you know, uh, would be like, what would treatment look like for 
uh, major depressive disorder if we were to take into account all the evidence, like the actual evidence, not the advertisement evidence, if you will. But I'm understanding that being whatever diagnosis you have in front of you uh, doesn't change the fact that uh, if it's MDD or if it is a psychotic syndrome or a, a mania, um, you still have to have this flexible approach, uh, this this creative approach, this, you know, let's see everything we have on the table. Our job is not exclusively prescribing drugs. F fair, fair statement? Absolutely. Um, of all the chapters of the book, the one that I felt was less critical on 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 a matter um, or on the limitations of the treatment that was more like status quo was the bipolar one, um, compared at least to the major depressive one. And you guys started in the beginning of the book. You guys mentioned the limitations of lithium that was great for some people, but was not this panacea. Um, um, but I didn't see a lot of review on how to address bipolarity in that chapter. I thought it was, a, 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 I think, a, let's call maybe a less aggressive chapter uh, compared to the other ones. In, any thoughts on, on why the, 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 that chapter was slightly different of the rest of the book, if, if my impression is correct? Well, I think your impression uh, certainly has validity uh, absolute validity as your impression. A, a, yeah, for me, it was uh, a hard chapter to write, having come from the field of bipolar disorders and specifically lithium research. And my friends in the lithium research field see that chapter as total heresy and disloyalty. So you might know that, or not know, that in last months or two months ago, uh, perhaps the issue of bipolar disorders is, uh, there's quite a bit of correspondence about a letter to the editor I wrote that lithium is not the first choice compound. There is no first choice, just as you said. You can use lithium, you can use anti-convulsants, several of them. You can use many, if not all, antipsychotics. Even first-generation antipsychotics were shown in the 50s to be prophylactic in bipolar disorder. And that lithium and the, sum, and the study of its biochemistry which uh, I did for years and helped me finance the growth of six children, it has not led to a single discovery about the nature of bipolar disorder biochemically. We don't even know how lithium works, and uh, it does something in some patients, but Olanzapine, a little olanzapine, helps some bipolar patients as well, and a little valproate or a little carbamazepine. So I got a lot of pushback from that chapter from my lithium friends, and so maybe I just ran out of energy and didn't uh, extend it to being more critical about in the way that you expected. But uh, and I did not address the issue, which is a very real issue, a very real issue of a person who had a single manic attack 20 years ago and is still taking uh, lithium or another anti bipolar drug. However, I can tell you that many of my colleagues did get the message that you ask, and so I am flooded with referrals from colleagues, because I'm very impressed with many of my colleagues, as much as the, with my many, my clinical colleagues, more than my academic colleagues, who are pharmaceutical companies supported, or who have to have a framework for their own belief system. I'm very impressed with my clinical colleagues, 
who have gotten the message of that chapter and who are sending me from all over the world patients who have been taking lithium or another anticonvulsant, but often another anti-bipolar, but often lithium for 20 or 30 years for second opinions as to whether perhaps they should stop what their chances are of stopping. And so people are open to this question, especially in the case of lithium because of the nephrotoxicity and uh, in people who've gone on to kidney transplants, they have taken lithium. And uh, it's particularly sad because you've had people who had a single manic attack and have been considered themselves 100% prophylactic successes. And it's true that they might be 100% prophylactic successes, or they just might not have needed lithium for the last 50 years. And it's a hard thing for clinicians to accept the fact that they might have exposed a patient unnecessarily. And so I applaud my colleagues for raising this question bravely and sending me many patients with that question. So, uh, but I don't have an answer to it. It's a harder illness to study because of its episodicity than chronic psychoses who can be more easily recruited into large studies. And, uh, and the issue with episodic bipolar disorder a also relates to the amount of damage that a person can do in an episode of mania, not necessarily to the diagnosis of the episode, but uh, sometimes a person who had a single episode did such serious things in that episode that he himself wants to continue prophylaxis no matter what the doctor says, because he just doesn't want to risk his marriage or his job in any way. And we know that people have done this for the beginning of time. Sometimes they've taken placebos or done all kinds of superstitious things because they believe it pulled them out of it the first time. I'm not sure we have scientific evidence one way or another. And, uh, and uh, the person's belief system with bipolar disorder medication, a, a often it's acceptable to them to take the medicine, and they fight it less than people who are treated with antipsychotics. In that sense, how well established is a maintenance therapy from a, from a research perspective? How well, it's certainly established only for a year or two. 10-year or 20-year prophylaxis is entirely anecdotal. And just like with the other medicines, we're talking about differences between 30% response to placebo, 60% respond to treatment, and 30% who don't respond despite treatment. So a person needs to know that he might not have an episode in the next two years, even if he doesn't take the treatment. So whether he takes the treatment or not depends somewhat on how severe the episode was and what he wants to prevent. And that brings us close to the rest of medicine, where, you know, whether you, you have a prostatectomy for, for prostate cancer does not depend on what the prostate cells look like. It depends more on your age and other factors. In that sense, right? So, so looking at the limitations we have and this, uh, what I would like to call more artistic approach to what we do, 
um, what would um, the treatment of, uh, the, the, let's say, depressive disorders look like if we were to take into account all the available evidence? Did you say of depressive disorder? Yeah. Well, I, I, th I think we need to work hard to reduce the use of medications in depression. We're giving out too much. We don't yet know which depressions respond and which don't. And we haven't been working hard enough to do that because there's so much pressure on it to give medicine to everyone. So we need to be more stingy. We need to tell people more often to let it pass, to look for psychotherapy, to look at what's that we may not be able to help. Unemployment causes a rise in the incidence of depression. Divorce causes a great rise in the incidence of depression. Certainly, social upheaval, war causes great rise. We can't be expected to have medicines for these things. Uh, I think short courses of benzodiazepines, folic acid, omega, should be tried before an antidepressant is tried, unless there's a past history of response, good response to an antidepressant. Most people come to us with past histories. So we need to emphasize that. Family histories as well. Something helped my uncle certainly give it a try. And, uh, and uh, so many other things from exercise to, to, uh, to CPAP to the world of, is full of other things. We recently did a study where 40% oxygen inhalation at night, not CPAP, not increased pressure, and not a chamber, just a mask with 40% instead of 20% oxygen, improved mood and energy significantly in resistant depressive patients. So there might be all kinds of things out there that one can work with, with different kinds of patients a, that... I think we need to see the antidepressants as a very limited a part of our armamentarium. Makes perfect sense to me. Makes makes perfect sense. Pesach, would you would you like to add anything? I I, I have little to add. I agree that uh, uh, the, the the antidepressants are justified in a small percentage of people who currently get them. Very often, most of the times. In our area, people who are treated with antidepressants receive the prescription from a family doctor, a uh, primary care physician, and not from a psychiatrist because, well, he seems depressed. I have an antidepressant. Makes sense. And, and it's unfortunate that it's caught on in that way. And uh, that's another one of the areas where I very much hope that the that our textbook will nudge the conversation and bring awareness to the legitimacy of not giving antidepressants. Someone's down, see if you can do more physical activity, as you mentioned, folic acid, if you can. I, I like giving hypericum, which uh, has some evidence for its value. And, uh, but, uh, uh, or uh, just talking about the person's life problems. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, we're... we're uh, this seems to be what needs to be the new consensus. It's fairly obvious to anyone who looks at the evidence and considers his own clinical experiences. 25 years ago that Irvin Kirsch made the claim that 75, 80% of, of drug response is placebo response. Uh, and and uh, many colleagues said that cannot be. And I thought, well, now that makes sense. That makes sense. Now I understand. 
Yeah, this this interface with uh, PCPs with primary care providers is quite challenging. I I work in a setting that has uh, many PCPs and then a few psych providers, and um, I'm in a good position as a director. But um, the discu- the clinical discussions went in a direction that I eventually had to promise that if they had any questions, I would provide a, uh, a guideline suitable answer because the complexity of the thought process behind it, it, it it's just not practical. It's just not practical for the, the way the job is done. So, so like I have, I have a, a psycho, I was a psychologist before I went to medical school and I have, um, I have an approach that we we could summarize as a quality of life approach. Like I don't try to change people's minds with psychotherapy. I, I try to work on discussing what the what needs to be changed in their reality. Um, it, it's roughly based on positive psychology, but also evolutionary psychology. And you know, I was trained in psychoanalysis as well. Um, so when they say, "Well, the patient has this thing and is depressed, and they try this medication and that medication," what what else could I give? Because that's the what else could I give seems to be. The, the answer that APA endorsed books are trying to answer. You can give this to, you can give that to. And, and when I ask questions like, okay, why is the patient depressed? Right? Why is the pa- what, what happened? What's missing? What's the difficulty here? And, and that you, you really, not only you cannot make a, um, a, a billion dollar commerce out of it, right? It doesn't favor the, 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 the sales of medications. Uh, you also, you you make it very difficult with the current uh i want to say standard of practices to yeah. actually reimbursement a, schemes and standard yes, of practice yes 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 it's uh it's uh, there, i i yeah. feel there are ways like nowadays i i have a private practice and i think i can sit in front of a judge and justify everything i have i've been doing just based on a very strict ethical uh uh code meaning between what well, we know that informed consents are actually not performed. I had this, this little joke that I used to do with my students. I would say, if you were insomniac, would you take Seroquel? And not once I found someone saying I would. However, their patients continue to accept when they offer. So that tells me that whatever information you have that will make you decline the Seroquel, your patients are not receiving. And, and, and th- that topic, you know, like I say, okay, so let me start doing this thing. And in fact, when you look at a patient actually discuss all these things, you know, share decision making, they make the decisions themselves if they, they're willing to take any risks here, right? I, I wouldn't use that for addictive substances, especially now in America with, with stimulants and, and benzodiazepines, because like people, you know, come asking for drugs for the name and, and, um, in a sense, chronic use of medications doesn't make a lot of the little we know about, you know, the little we know about brain physiology, the chronic use of medications sh- should be a state of exception while PRN use, it's much more understandable. It, it makes yes. a lot of sense. Yeah, I made that point in my benzodiazepine chapter. That was the point. And I would like to say, coming back to the very beginning, You asked me why we wrote this book. We wrote this book so that people like you will have something to hold up to the judge. That is, you now have someone you can quote. Guys, listen, if if you guys have any closing statements. uh, That was it for me. We (laughs) wrote it so that people who have already learned these things from their patients and started to see, can see that they are not alone. That's unspeakably important. Let me tell you, I am pleased to talk to you guys. I'm going to tell the listeners again, please consider getting this book, all right? It's it's unbelievable. It's so grounded. And and now, as you read, you're going to understand the difference between um, you're, go- you're going to have a sense of what evidence-based should mean if it wasn't for the, for the, for the commercial bias. It, it is a very grounded and raw description of what reality of medication use in the field of psychiatry is, not from a, um, 
it's not uh, don't get me wrong this book is not a a angry rant against the pharmaceutical companies instead is a okay what is the data in favor what is the data against which is very different uh, of uh, most psychopharm books or every psychopharm book you have read until this day and you only know that you only realize that difference by reading this book psychopharmacology revisited guys available on amazon available on amazon i didn't get yet my my hard copy they had a problem apparently they shipped and they lost it so i, I i'm gonna i have to order again Re reconsidered psychopharmacology reconsidered psychopharmacology reconsidered did i did i mean did i mess up the name of it it's reconsidered. revisited revision will be called revisited meanwhile thank you guys thank you very much for your time okay i really appreciate it